My name is Megan Johnson. I'm one of the staff orthopedic surgeons here at Texas Scottish Rite, and I'm going to be talking about scoliosis. Scoliosis is a structural, lateral, rotated curvature of the spine. To qualify as true scoliosis, the minimum Cobb angle must be 10 degrees. Cobb angle is measured as the angle between the most tilted vertebrae and the curve of interest. So here it would be this vertebrae to this vertebrae, and that would measure the lumbar Cobb angle. And for the thoracic curve, it would be this vertebrae to this vertebrae, and that would measure the thoracic Cobb angle. If the angle measures less than 10 degrees, we don't consider it to be true scoliosis and we call it spinal asymmetry. Idiopathic scoliosis means that all other causes have been ruled out. Anything that has a vertebral malformation where the vertebrae wasn't formed correctly or wasn't separated from the other surrounding vertebrae correctly is considered congenital scoliosis. And then there's also neuromuscular and syndromic scoliosis, which occurs in patients who have underlying neurologic disorders such as cerebral palsy, spina bifida, and multiple other genetic conditions. Adolescent scoliosis is defined as being older than nine years old at the time of the diagnosis. If the patient is between zero and three years old, we consider that early onset scoliosis. And if they're between four and nine years old, we consider that juvenile scoliosis. The x-ray on the left is a typical curve that we would see in a patient with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. The curve typically goes to the right and it can include either, either the thoracic or lumbar spine or both. In the patient's x-ray in the middle, this is representative of a typical neuromuscular curve. Usually these are long C-shaped curves. The patient is obviously not able to stand, so they're sitting in their x-ray and you can see a tracheostomy. And sometimes you'll see other clues on the x-ray that leads you to know that, that, that it's a neuromuscular curve. The x-ray on the right shows an example of congenital scoliosis. If you look in the middle of that x-ray, Right here, you can see that there's a hemivertebrae that didn't completely form between those two normal vertebrae around T11 and T12. There's a common misconception amongst our patients who we see that scoliosis, if left untreated, can cause horrendous deformity and lead to early death. And a lot of this was perpetuated by some early studies that were done that did show um, scoliosis to cause severe disabling back pain and cardiopulmonary compromise. Unfortunately, these studies that were done early on were very flawed. They included non-idiopathic causes of scoliosis and they include patients with early onset scoliosis who if left untreated could end up with the X-ray like we see on the right. Um, but this is typically not the course that we see in idiopathic scoliosis. Stuart Weinstein, who is in Iowa, did a really nice study um, looking at untreated scoliosis in a um, cohort of adolescent patients. And in fact, the study was so well designed and the results were so um, helpful that the study was actually published in JAMA, which as you can imagine for an orthopedic study is a pretty big deal. Um, so he looked at 117 patients who were diagnosed with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis who had 50 year follow up. Um, and these patients were all compared to age and sex match, matched controls. He looked at long term outcomes of the patients with scoliosis and noted that the rate of survival for patients with untreated scoliosis was equal to that of those who didn't have it. They did find a small increase in shortness of breath amongst the patients with scoliosis versus the controls. However, this risk was mostly associated with curves that were greater than 80 degrees that were located in the thoracic spine. They also noted that there was a, an increase in chronic low back pain in patients with scoliosis versus those who didn't have it. However, the patients who reported having back pain reported that the pain was little or moderate and not disabling and did not keep them from having an excellent quality of life. So in conclusion, untreated scoliosis patients can live a functional and productive life at 50 years of follow-up. And their biggest complaints at that point in time are usually pain and the cosmetic appearance of their deformity. Unless their curves are extremely large, um, 80 to 90 degrees or more, they really are not having significant cardiopulmonary compromise.
and they're not having excruciating disabling pain. In terms of evaluation, it's really important to get a good um, history on these patients in terms of back pain, a history of headaches, any neurologic symptoms. Um, and for girls, it's really important to get a menstrual history so that we can gauge uh, where they are in their growth cycle. And it's also really important for us to know if there's a family history of scoliosis. On physical exam, these are the things we look for to um, give us a clue that there's a true scoliosis deformity. We look at shoulder height. On this patient, you can see that the left shoulder is higher than the right shoulder. We also look at scapular asymmetry. So a lot of times we'll see that the scapulas are um, different heights or that one is more retracted than another. We also will look for pelvic obliquity. Um, so it's not uncommon for patients to feel like their hips are off. And um, we can examine this by putting a finger on each iliac crest and then seeing if those fingers are, are at the same level. We also look for trunk shift. So if you were to draw an imaginary line from the patient's head to their waist, um, we like to see that the head is nicely centered over their waist, but sometimes because of the curve, you'll see that the trunk goes off to one side versus the other. We also look for waist asymmetry. So if the patient has a lumbar scoliosis or lumbar curve, we'll see that on the convex side of the curve, which is usually the left side in the lumbar spine, we'll see that there's a, a more of a bulge of the left waist. And if you look on the right side where the concave part of the curve is, you'll see that the waist crease goes in a little bit and there's an asymmetry there. Uh, we also look at Adams Ford bend tests and this is, um, the test that most of our patients know the best because it happens at school all the time. But what we're looking for on this is a rotational deformity. So if you see this child who's bending forward, you can see that um, on the picture here to the left, the arrow is pointing at a left lumbar prominence, which is due to the rotation of the curve. So when the curve forms in the coronal plane, it also has rotation in the axial plane and it causes a rotational deformity. If you look at the two pictures on the right, the picture on the top shows the left lumbar prominence, and then the picture on the bottom shows the prominence of the ribs from the right thoracic curve. The next step in evaluation is to do a um, thorough neuro exam. So we look at um, sensation of the lower extremities and the motor function, so testing all the motor groups. And then we look at reflexes. Um, the three that we look at are the patellar tendon, Achilles tendon, and abdominal reflexes. The patellar tendon reflexes test the L2, L3, and L4 nerve roots, and the Achilles tendon reflex tests S1 and S2. And we're really looking for symmetry. So it's okay to be a little hyperreflexic if it's symmetric on both sides. And then we look at abdominal reflexes because that really gives us a little bit of a gauge of the thoracic spinal cord. And so that's done by scratching um, in the four quadrants around the uh, belly button, which you can see by the arrows on the bottom. And the belly button should actually jump to the side where you're scratching. And you can do that with your fingernail or a pen cap. Um, and again, it's okay for these to be absent as long as they're absent on both sides. If you see the belly button jump to one side, but then not the other, that would be an asymmetric and abnormal finding. We also then look for um, any a gross foot abnormality or deformity like a cavo varus foot or a significant flat foot that's just on one side that can be indicative of an underlying neurologic cause. Next, we um, need to have an x-ray to assess the patient's scoliosis. Um, and it's really helpful for us to get this full length um, x-ray of their spine, which also includes their pelvis and the uh, top part of their uh, hips and femurs. Um, this gives us really all the information we need uh, in order to determine what the curve looks like, how big the curves are, and then whether or not their um, growth plates are present and um, and where they are in terms of skeletal maturity. And so, um, honestly. Um, when we get patients referred from um, other places who've had x-rays done, I would say 85 to 90% of the time, the x-rays are not the ones that we need to determine a accurate treatment plan. And so we end up repeating them anyways. And so I would tell any pediatrician's office or outside practice that unless you um, have radiologists who know 
and radiology techs who know how to take this kind of a scoliosis x-ray, really, we, we really prefer to just see the patient without x-rays and get our own because we end up repeating them anyways. Um, and also we have this really cool technology, uh, it's called EOS, and it's um, the picture here on the bottom left um, of this patient standing in this big chamber. And it allows us to take this x-ray with really low dose radiation. Um, and so it's honestly a, a better way to do it than to take a um, two uh, regular x-rays of the thoracic and lumbar spine and try to stitch them together. So again, um, if there's a, a question about whether or not you should order x-rays before sending a patient on, um, really our preference is to just go ahead and send them and we'll take care of the x-ray part for you. So sometimes we see these patients and we decide that they need to have an MRI to further assess their spinal cord and neural access. Um, and the reasons why we would choose to do that are if a patient um, has a left-sided curve, which is abnormal. We would also do this if a patient has more of a round back than we would expect. So typically in regular idiopathic scoliosis, the back is more flat um, than it should be. And that's due to the rotational um, part of the deformity. However, some patients present with a curve that really has some extra kyphosis in or extra round back. And that's unusual. And those are the patients that we would consider an MRI on. We would also consider an MRI if a patient has a more abnormal appearing curve. So, uh, you know, typically a curve is in the thoracic spine or the lumbar spine or both. Um, and it's kind of a predictable size curve um, and it just has a typical appearance. So this x-ray on the left is a little different of a curve than we typically see. So that might clue us in to get an MRI. And the two x-rays on the right show a curve that's very um, short and sharp. And um, that lateral x-ray shows a lot of kyphosis and that would be a red flag for this patient needing an MRI. We would also get further imaging if the patient had an abnormal neurologic exam, if they complained of daily headaches, if we saw them uh, at one point and then saw them back six months later and noticed they had significant progression in their curve, we would consider a MRI. Um, we consider this if they fail um, bracing and had um, done the bracing appropriately as we prescribed them. And then, um, in every case of early onset or juvenile scoliosis, we get an MRI because the incidence of um, spinal cord or brainstem abnormalities is about 20%. So we feel like it's worth it to screen all those patients. And the reason we get the MRI is to look for a Chiari malformation, a syrinx in the spinal cord, a tumor, tethered cord. There's a variety of things that we sometimes find when we look for it. In terms of treatment, our decision is really made based on the age of the patient, how skeletally mature they are and how big their curve is. Our goal is to keep the curve as small as possible, um, specifically under 50 degrees and, and to prevent the curve from getting worse to the point where the patient would need surgery. Um, Stuart Weinstein also did a very nice study to help us figure out which curves um, were at risk of progressing um, which helps guide us, our, guide us on our treatment. Um, so he looked at a, a population of patients for 40 years and looked to see how much the curves progress based on how big the curve was at the time the patient stopped growing. So if the curve was less than 30 degrees at the time of skeletal maturity, those really tended not to progress um, very much at all. So if you look at this table, 30 to 50 degrees had a risk of uh, progression by about 10 degrees, which isn't bad. If the curves got to 50 degrees or more, those were the curves that seemed to have the most risk of progression. Um, and in this uh, table, you can see here that for a thoracic curve, it could progress 30 degrees over the following 40 years, which leaves you with you know, a fairly significantly sized curve um, at adulthood. So this is really the study that leads us to the conclusion that 50 degrees is the threshold for us to recommend surgery for these patients because we want to prevent them from having the scenario where they start with a 50 degree curve and end up with an 80 or 90 degree curve as an adult. So short of surgery, um, for patients with curves between 25 and 40 degrees, we would recommend bracing. Um, this is only in patients who have two years um, of growth remaining. So that's about 13, at least, uh, sorry, 13 is the oldest in boys and about 11 or 12 in girls. Um, and we recommend that they wear their brace 
um, either full time, so 18 to 20 hours a day, or just at nighttime. And that really depends on the curve uh, type and how flexible we think it is. So this is a TLSO brace, um, a uh, thoracal lumbar sacral orthosis. And this would be a brace that's worn 18 to 20 hours a day, typically used for um, either curves in the thoracic spine or curves in both the thoracic and lumbar spine. And if you look at this picture on the right here, there's a little button and that button there allows us to measure exactly how long the patient is wearing it during the day so we can assess their compliance. The patient has a lumbar curve only um, and it's flexible. We will typically um, try to get away with a nighttime brace so they only have to wear it at night. Um, what we use here at Scottish Rite is a Providence brace, but you may also come across um, patients being prescribed a Charleston brace, which is really the same idea. It's just a slightly different type of brace. And then we do recommend surgery when the patient has reached um, a curve of 50 degrees, and this is really to prevent further progression of the curve into adulthood. Uh, we also have a secondary benefit of being able to help correct the deformity so we can make the rib hump um, better. We can try to level out their shoulders and try to bring, bring back some of that natural roundness in their back that they should have. We try not to do this until a patient is at least 10 years old. Um, if you do the fusion too early, the patient's spine has too much growth left and we can cause some secondary issues if they undergo this surgery at, a, at too early of a time point. So we're usually waiting till it, around 10 or, or later. So in terms of referral, um, the short answer to when to refer a patient with scoliosis is anytime you think that a patient may have it. Um, we're really happy to see a patient anytime and either give them the great news that they don't have scoliosis or talk to them further if they do. The long answer is that any patient who's skeletally immature with any kind of a curve, no matter what size, really should be seen by a specialist. If you have a skeletally mature patient who has a significant deformity that you can see on clinical exam, that patient should be referred for sure. And then any patient, regardless of how old they are or how big you think the deformity may be, who has an abnormal exam, who has cr chronic and um, uh, activity interfering back pain, daily headaches, a weird foot deformity on one side, anything that strikes you as a little odd is a great reason to refer that patient. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. We are happy to see a patient anytime if, if you think there's scoliosis, even if the patient ends up having a perfectly straight spine, we love to be able to give good news too. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's, it's definitely okay and, and mostly preferred to defer an x-ray if you can so that we can get the kind of imaging we want and not have to repeat it. Thank you so much for your attention.